Hello and welcome to Talk Time. My guest today is from Bangladesh, but is a truly global personality. As a career professional with the World Bank for more than three decades, he helped shape higher education and non-formal education policies in several parts of the world, including Ethiopia, Iran, and Saudi Arabia. Well, he is also an acclaimed Bangladeshi novelist with a strong Assam link. Apart from his better half being from Assam, one of his novels, Bisholito Shomoy, centers around the 17th century Ahom princess, Nagsen Gaboru. My guest is none other than Dr. Abdun Noor. Dr. Abdun Noor, welcome to my show. You have been with the World Bank for more than three decades, uh, based out of Washington. You have traveled the world. Uh, you know, right from the time you obtained your PhD in educational administration uh, from the Michigan State University in 1965, uh, you have been basically working through the World Bank, of course, in shaping higher education policies around the world, particularly in least developing countries. Uh, now, what has been your experience? Why, what is the importance of education in today's world, particularly in developing countries? Thank you, Wesby, for inviting me to your show and, and giving me the opportunity to talk about our work that I have devoted to. Yes, higher education has been a very important part of my career, but it also you cannot, included the non-formal education, primary and secondary education in the continents of Africa, South Asia, Caribbean, right. and others. The thing, right, the more, at this stage when I joined the bank in 1970, McNamara was interested in the poverty alleviation program because at that time out of 5 billion people, at least 3 billion was under dismal poverty right. with less than $110 per capita income. So he was looking for instruments of the World Bank on which he can enable poverty elevation in the developing countries and most of the least developing countries, which includes South Asia yeah. and Africa. And we realized that though the emphasis on higher education and the, and the universities of higher education the higher education system in countries like Africa and South Asia and, and others are more oriented to the curriculum of, of the Western countries okay. and not relevant to us. Even in the primary education and secondary education, our children know more about daffodils than our own flowers. They know more about the dances and musics of Europe and Munich and Russia mm -hmm. and other than walls, what is happening. They know more in about walls and foxtrot and things like that the, than our classical stuff, which we all admire and uh, praise. Yes. Yeah. The, uh, what is happening, Bihu and, uh, and and all other relative things. So we thought that the group that we worked in the world back at the time in the policy making with the president and the group. We thought that empowerment of the people, empowerment with the help of the government in the field of education would be one of the quickest avenue to grow. And at that situation, we emphasize primary education, basically for the women and empowering women through primary education <coughs> for Africa. Similarly, the, in South Asia, the primary education was much more broad-based compared yeah. to Africa. But in South Asia, the women had to come out, the girls had to have yeah. the rights, that their own empowerment, which was not given to them by the so family. How and how difficult or easy was it to explain to these least developing countries? You, work, you worked in Ethiopia, you worked in Iran. Uh, now, issue is, uh, how easy or difficult was it for the World Bank 
and people like you who are directly into the program to explain to the administrations, the, to the regimes, uh, the political dispensation in these countries about shaping a proper education policy to deal with poverty. You see, I think our task was not very difficult. I would rather say quite easy. Uh, what we needed to do is the common man's language. If you use a jargon and, and you talk about difficult ways, mm -hmm. but if when we are going to the common ground and common way of ex explaining what needs to be done and why it needs to be done, in early 75, in 1975-76, for a project in Bangladesh, we included financing for toilets. And there was criticism, uh, just an example, from our own policy makers in Bangladesh, why should I l take loan, why Bangladesh should take loan for building toilets from the World Bank. Okay? Once we were able to explain to them, and I was help, I help also in the, in the, in the five-year plan uh, of the Bangladesh, first five-year plan. Once we explained to the policy makers and the politicians and others. They understood. They understood. Because, because toilets are very l clearly directly linked to the school dropout rates, yes. particularly the girl students. I think we took, You agree on that? Yes, absolutely. Absolutely too. And with that empowerment also we gave them stipends, scholarships. We didn't have um, banks in villages, but somehow or other we made the schools headmasters responsible. So the girls were given stipends which they could, no, they, they could themselves only use and not their parents. If the parent had to withdraw from the girls' fund, they needed three signatures, including the signature of the headmaster. Okay. So, so, so the money comes to the, to the but the, the parents cannot withdraw the amount. Yes. Mm -hmm. and, and later on uh, in mid-80s, we tried to do it in Caribbean islands and Latin America and also in Africa. They will tie these scholarships with age, uh, with marriage. If you, you get, if, unless you get your secondary education, your stipends will not be fully disbursed, you know, some way. And if you get married, your it stipend... It completely will, stopped. Yes. So that was, that was, uh, that was actually helping uh, target two things. One, uh, that was encouraging the girls to come to school uh, for higher education. Uh, with the scholarship second, it was preventing child marriage. Precisely. Remember Napoleon said, one thing we learned from the history, yeah. he said, give us a good mother and I will give you a good nation. And he said it as a politician, how much he realized Emperor Napoleon, I do not know. Mm -hmm. But so, so today looking back, uh, Dr. Abdul Noor, uh, poverty and education is the battle over. Uh, today we are in the 21st century. And uh, you have uh, now retired after putting in your efforts for more than three decades with the World Bank, working exclusively in this sector of education. You have seen poverty. You have seen how education alleviates poverty. Uh, today, what are your thoughts? Uh, you know, have, is the battle over? Why is the battle, if not over, why is it still going on? The battle on human development will never be over. It will be continually we have to fight for developing human beings in a different way. Uh, accessing children to the higher education, that battle is over. There are many thousands and thousands of students are there. The, the issue is what they are learning. Are they learning relevant to the requirements of the developing economy or not? Economy has changed. The shape of economy, the nature of economy, the skills of the economy have changed. Does the, those who are coming out of the universities, do they meet those skills needs or not? If they don't meet that skills need, that it is whose responsibility to provide that skills needs? Is the administrators. So you are saying that an university education, an university degree may or may not be good enough uh, for someone to have a proper livelihood in today's world? Are you saying that? Yes, absolutely. Unless the curriculum is tied to the new development, which means the new technology, how the technology can be used, 
how the internet and the SaaS system should be used, as well as the industrial growth production, the new techniques of, of, of production, manufacturing and others. Everything should be interlinked. Yes. Absolutely. Uh, that is a very critical statement made by Dr. Abdul Noor. He's saying that a university degree in today's world may or may not be enough to provide a boy or a girl, a uh, student, a good livelihood opportunity. It has to be have a proper linkage with the industry and the situation around an individual. On that note, I go for a short break. Don't go away. I'll be right back in conversation with educator and novelist Dr. Abdun Noor. <laughs> Welcome back. I am in conversation with Dr. Abdul Noor, a former World Bank official who is an educator and helped shape higher education policies in many parts of the world. Dr. Abdul Noor, we are in a very critical stage of this conversation. Uh, you know, look at the Indian subcontinent, India, uh, 1.3 billion people. Look at Bangladesh, a huge population. We have a very population neighbor. You come from that country. We have China. I'm not talking only about the Indian subcontinent. We're talking about our neighborhood. Look at Pakistan. Uh, poverty is a critical factor. Bangladesh is still struggling with it. India also today have a large, uh, you know, uh, huge poor population. People are still below the poverty line. There's a large number of people. Now, how is education linked? You were saying you have indicated in your earlier segment that educational curriculum could be even flawed. So what are some of the things that comes to your mind? Okay, it's very easy to say that, uh, you know, our today's day of the internet and so on, we have to have a link, proper, proper industry interface. But is it really happening? Where is the problem? It's not really, it is happening, not, but it's not happening as much as it should. Look at the, the India, it has the highest number of higher education in the world. Not, not because it is a large country, but because of the fact it's traditions. The higher education have been the pillar of India for 200 years. Even, you know, in the thousands of institutions and others. Yeah. Compare that with other countries like, like China, Japan, and Latin American countries, or Africa. The number of higher education institutions have been very limited. But when the new economy generated, India moved forward very, very fast. But have they changed the curriculum to the extent that the new economy desires? And whose responsibility is that? I think it's more responsibility for those who need the employees to come to the administrator and say that the system of our employment is changing, our work it atmosphere is changing. We are going to build a partnership with you to get your products. Now, let me get, let me bring, uh, ask you to comment on your example from Bangladesh. You know, uh, Muhammad Yunus. If you look at his uh, microfinance revolution, which he brought about in Bangladesh, and uh, a model that was replicated in many many parts of the world, uh, Muhammad Yunus, I had the privilege of meeting him on two occasions, and he had told me uh, that you know our uh, Grameen uh, Bank and our microfinance model has been used even by countries like Brazil, but nobody in our neighborhood uh, must be referring. He must have referred to India. Have ever invited me to replicate my model here? Although we have almost the same kind of economies. Now, now my question is not that, I'm just giving, that was an aside, you see, uh, Dr. Abdul Noor. My question is, microfinance, that revolution which Bangladesh uh, experienced quite successfully at one point, do you think uh, that has also helped with the women getting empowered, women generating income, do you think that helped the children uh, get proper education in a much better way than perhaps they would have without the microfinance? I mean, what I'm trying to uh, get a response from you is on how is poverty, education, uh, liqu cash liquidity responsible? Uh, are they interlinked at the end? Talking about Dr. Yunus and microfinance, I had the privilege of knowing him as a academic, as a collegiate, and also as, his, as looking into his work and other. He has, 
his concept of only one concept, there are many of it, the linking microfinance and the Grameen Fund, the technology that came in in early 90s, yeah. and to make available that technology to the poorest of the poor, the women, the women leaders in the community, giving them that hand phone, when it, very few others, helping them in deciding the market, the price of the market, the price of the rice, the vegetable and crop, deciding the women to decide on the health factors, the, that elderly women became the clubhouse where everybody came for learning to them, getting the lesson on market, on health, Did on it impact production. on education of their children? Of course. You see the growth, of the alertness of the women. I'm very proud of the women of Bangladesh, the young women of Bangladesh. They are self-reliant, they have the, their empowerment, they're growing, they believe in themselves, you know. And I believe Dr. Yunus has a significant step towards it. Along with, he's not the only one, with it there have many other many organizations others. gaming, mm -hmm. many other NGOs have been working in it. But, the, and, and which gave rise to the leadership of women in Bangladesh. The Prime Minister is, is a woman, the Speaker is yeah. a woman, and you know, you can see the, the so this is, this is, uh, this is I think a, a considerable achievement, mm -hmm. of so, which I am proud of as Bangladeshi. Now, now, now come to non-formal education. Do you think non-formal education holds the key? Take the case of India. 65% of India's population is in the age group of 35 years, roughly. 65%. That's a huge. Therefore, imagine the job that requires to be created uh, to enable these young people in India to be employed, to have a livelihood option of their own. My question is, uh, you know, therefore, do you think university degrees, do you think there can be jobs in the formal sector? Do you think there can be government jobs? Do you think actually in view of this job crisis, do you think informal sector holds the key? Because that is one area where you have specialized all these years. You see, there is two requirements. Informal sector is key to employment. Key to employment. Key to, without, you need, for generating employment for the new, newly emerging unemployed who are from the age group 16, 18 and onwards up to age 35 also. They are remaining unemployed because they are, cannot link whatever they have acquired from the system or for the community or from the local workshop and other it is to the employment that they need. That link has to be established and that's the key. Higher education is important, but it has to be applied if we are going to the public sector jobs yeah. or private sector managements. If you need secondary education and other, you need a different side of, sort of education. And there, the civil knowledge and others could be provided secondary, but actually skills has to come from the public, private sector. And they should be able to work in the, in the, in the industries and others as an intern. And that collaboration has to be created. Now, if we, we talk about today uh, making education compulsory, what has been your experience? Uh, can we draw a comparison? Is it possible to make education compulsory? Uh, why are there so much of school dropouts? What about the teaching methodology? You referred to curriculums. So, uh, you know, in the Western countries, why are people from the subcontinent so much in demand uh, in the West, even today? I would not use the word compulsory because compulsory means something legal and you need to enforce it. Having education, people should have the desire to have the right education at whatever level they are. And they should prepare themselves to get that education. Our responsibility, policymakers' responsibility would be to make those opportunities available. Now to answer the question why the dropouts are, the second primary school dropouts are mainly, you know, health factors, toilets health. and other, others, and some poverty issues. But the dropouts for the secondary level is clearly 
the mix between what they are learning in the schools and the what is required outside industry, there is a mismatch. And the higher education, you have to go for policy oriented and you have to find those areas whether you go in liberal arts or management and others. Yeah. That's, that's the... Uh, you see that Abdul Noor there, Dr. Abdul Noor, talking about a mismatch between what is taught in some of the educational institutions and what is needed outside in the real world. On that note, I go for another short break. Don't go away. I'll be right back. <laughs> Welcome back. I'm still in conversation with Dr. Abdul Noor, educator and novelist. Uh, Dr. Abdul Noor, uh, you are also an accomplished novel. You are well known in Bangladesh. You have written four novels and three to four plays. And one of your, one of your novels, Bisholito Shomoy, or The Uncertain Times, uh, have been quite popular. In fact, it has got uh, recognition as the best publication in the year 2005. But interestingly, we are having this interview in Gohati, and your novel, Bisolito Samoy, which has got Bangladesh's best publication recognition in 2005, that novel has a strong Assam link. You know, that novel, in that novel, you are talking about the novel centers around an Ahum princess by the name of Nagsen Gaburu. It's a 17th century Ahom princess. Uh, you know, I want you to tell my, our viewers as to wh who was Nagsen Gaburu in your own words. Why did you decide to write about her? It's an Ahom princess, but you have written in a Bangladesh context because there's a strong Bangladesh link as well to Nagsen Gaburu who is known in Bangladesh popularly as Bibi Pori. And her grave uh, is an important tourist attraction, important mausoleum in Dhaka. Uh, Naksen Gaburu and your novel, Bisolito Shomai. You know, I learned about, as you say, my wife is from Assam. Your wife is from, from Assam. Assam, yes. My father-in-law is Mr. Khairuddin Ahmed from Gualpara, Assam. So, and so I do it. Visited Gualpara number of times after marriage, almost every year or yeah. so. And I came across with a small novel or a book, which was given to me by Dr. Otulando Otulando Goswami. Goswami. Yeah, well-known educationist. Yes, and my brother-in-law, uh, Mr. Nurun Nobi, with whom I very respect very much, and there. This talk about Nansen Gavaru was written. She was the daughter of Raja Joyadhar Sinha. And during 1670... Joyadhar Sinha. Sinha. Yeah. Sinha. Mm -hmm. During 1670-75, during, during that period, she, Nansen Gavari, was nine years old yeah. when she was about to be coronated as the future king of Ahom. Because Raja, her future, father... Future queen? No, king. King, okay. King. Because Raja said, I don't have a son, but I don't believe that the son should succeed a son. My daughter can also succeed. Daughter can succeed. And it was with that thing, which is opposed by the 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 Chakrodha saying Sinha uncle and even her own mother to break that tradition. But what happened is Mirjumla also came at that time and as he was retreating he took as a condition Nansen Gavaru back to uh, first to Narayanganj in Dhaka and back and then to Delhi. And in Delhi Nansen Gavaru grew up from, from nine, for 10 years, from 9 years to 19 years. And then she got married as the fir, uh, first wife of Arangayev's third son, uh, Azam Shah. And then she came back to Dhaka as the wife of the Subedar. Azam Shah was... Azam Shah was 
dispatched to Dhaka as the subedar by the Mughals. By the, by Aurangzeb, yeah, yeah. Gubal, by, as the by Aurangzeb, yeah. yeah. And she stayed here for fifteen. So months. so let me recap. Uh, you, your novel, this is, in fact, uh, viewers, this is the novel, uh, Bisholito Shomoy. This is actually, this is in two volumes. This is the novel written by Abdun Noor. Uh, this was got the best publication recognition in Bangladesh for the year uh, 2005. In this novel, actually, uh, Dr. Abdun Noor, who's sitting right across me, it talks about an Ahum princess, uh, Nagsen Gaburu, was the daughter of uh, Ahom King Chakradha Joydhar Joydhar Singha uh, in the 17th century. Uh, now you, you, you're saying that uh, you're saying, Dr. Noor, uh, that you know Mir Jumla uh, his attack. He was retreating. Then he took uh, her took, took her uh, along with him when she was just nine years old. Yes, and some accounts say. Some accounts, some uh, history says that Mir Jumla, while retreating, died and he is uh, passed away and his grave is uh, in Garo Hills uh, along the border with Bangladesh, present Bangladesh. So you are saying that she finally reached Delhi to the Mughal court and grew up from the year of nine and around 19 years she got married to Aurangzeb's third son, uh, Ahmed uh, Azam Shah. Azam Shah. And Azam Shah, when he was posted as the subedar of Bengal, 1670, six, July of 1678. July of 1678 came to Dhaka. So Naksen Gavaru came to Dhaka. Now that's a very interesting part. And and tell me about uh, Naksen Gavaru's tomb or grave still in Dhaka. How she, did she stay back in Dhaka? What do you think? You see, along with Naksen Gavaru. Azam Shah had two other wives, the daughter of Shuja and the daughter of Shasta Khan. After 15 months, Azam Shah was taken back uh, to headquarters, Delhi, uh, Delhi to, and Mughal history shows that the daughter of Shuja and the daughter of Shasta Khan went back to Delhi with Azam Shah, but the Mughal history have no trace of what has happened to Rahmat Banu, which was the Mughal name of so, Nangsen So Gabbar. you are saying that Mughal history had no trace after that what happened to uh, Nagsen Gaburu, the Ahom princess. So your novel, your novel is, uh, you, your novel talks about July 1678 to October 1679. That's right, 15-month that, that period. 15-month period, the novel centers around That's the right. happenings, events in that period, July 1678 to October 1679. Uh, then you are saying that while Azam Shah was transferred back to Delhi. It took uh, Suja's daughter, who was his wife, as well as Shaista Khan's daughter, who was, who was his wife. But his other wife, that is the Ahom princess Naksen Gaburu, whether she went back or not is not known. So Mughal history is silent on that. Did you study Ahom history? Does Ahom history throw light on that? Ahom history says her uncle, Chakradhas Singha, uh, Singha's emissary came to see her in, in Dhaka. Dhaka. Okay. And she said, my uncles have not taken uh, thought after me and do, looked after me, but I have not forgotten my land and my son, she was expecting at that time, would one day will be the king but of reclaim the land. And she, she said would, that. And she came all the way to, the history says that she came all the way near to Manas. Uh, lake, you know. Manas National Park. National Park. Okay, now, 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 Nangsen Gavaru, whether she went back to Delhi is not clear, but her uh, a son, she named her son apparently Sunenfa. According to her friend, to her friend, Sunenfa. Sunenfa. Yes. The, the tiger from the heaven. The tiger from the heaven. Uh, despite, Descending from the heaven. Despite marrying the Ahom general. Uh, sorry, right. despite marrying the Mughal general. She Precisely. named her son. She kept her linkage with the Ahom dynasty. Yes. Sunenfa. Now the question is, are you now trying to say, Dr. Abdul Noor, that both Ahom history and Mughal history doesn't say much about, can we say that this is the lost princess? This is the lost will princess. Will be correct to say that? But definitely this is the lost princess. But I am talking about this novel along with the lost princess. 
we have lost many, many other values that we had in this rich land of Bangla and Assam. Now, you see, I have read somewhere uh, that, you know, uh, there is a tomb, uh, there is a mausoleum in Dhaka, uh, which is uh, name of Pori Bibi. Yes, in Lalbagh Fort. In Lalbagh yes. Fort. Is Pori Bibi the local name uh, for Nagsen Gaburu? No, that the local people think Pori Bibi is the daughter of Shaista Khan. So, not Nagsen Gaburu? Not Nagsen Gaburu. So, Nagsen Gaburu's, uh, uh, you know, whether she was buried, what happened to her? So, there is no trace. No trace. No one knows about it. There have been few articles written about it. It is hardly known. So, I am trying to project. What are you saying in the novel? I'm, what are you trying to project? I am trying to say that, that this, this, she is a symbol of friendship between the two lands who kept her own identity and her own pride as the Ahom princess in the land of Ahom. At the same time, she carried her own responsibility um, as the wife of a Subedar. To love the people and the daughter of, daughter of an Ahom king. And the daughter of Ahom king. Who to love the people of Bangladesh and other. But somehow or other, uh, history has, I am a fiction writer, so yeah. as a novelist, somehow they have, we have forgotten her. Okay, uh, history may have forgotten her, but you as a novelist have tried to revive the memory of that Ahom princess. Uh, and I hope this novel, someone decides to translate it into Assamese or at least an English version of that uh, so that people can read it widely. Of course, Bengali is read by many people here, so it will not be a problem unless it is difficult to find your book. But today's day and age, uh, Dr. Abdul Noor, uh, thank you very much for thank being you on very my much. show. It was a pleasure talking to you. Thank you very much. It is my pleasure and made my visit very fruitful. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.